ما يمشوش لان انا راديولوجيست بس يعني عاوز حد يكلمني عن الجراحه عاوز حد يقول للدكتور اسامه ما تعملش حالات عاوز حد يقول للدكتور فاروق ما تحقنش عيانين فعاوزين جراح لو سمحت لو في حد في القاعه جراح ما يمشي نيكست سبيكر دكتور فاروق حسن هي از وان اوف ذا ايمنت اندو فاسكولار راديولوجيست بليز دكتور فاروق هيز توبك ويل بي اندو فاسكولار مانجمنت اوف ثيرويد Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for your invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure being here today with you. So, um, uh, so actually, uh, we have uh, the current therapies for Graves' disease nowadays uh, include surgery, uh, antithyroid drugs, and radioactive iodine. And uh, but we know that some patients uh, may refuse to receive any of. Uh, uh, those options and may be contraindicated for all of them. Like, for example, if we have an elderly patient who cannot tolerate the antithyroid drugs, uh, he may be a poor uh, surgical candidate and he cannot receive radioactive iodine for uh, any reason. Or, for example, whenever we have a patient who, uh, with uh, cardiac arrhythmia uh, and receiving amiodarone that may cause uh, hyperthyroidism, and the patient may be unfit for any of uh, the treatment uh, approaches that we mentioned before. Uh, also, we may have a young woman, for example, uh, in the childbearing uh, uh, period, uh, she may be allergic for antithyroid drug. She may refuse to receive radioactive iodine therapy for fear uh, uh, of uh, its effect on uh, pregnancy. Uh, and uh, she may refuse uh, to be treated surgically for uh, cosmetic reasons. Also, we may have patients with uh, large goiters. Uh, having severe hyperthyroidism that may be difficult to control by any of the means that we uh, mentioned before as well. Uh, and therefore, we, we, we have a need for uh, other alternative methods for management of uh, those types of patients. We know that the percutaneous ablation, as we, we saw uh, by uh, Professor Osama Hitta, that uh, it's, it's a well-established technique with very good results. But we know that we have some limitations regarding maybe the size or uh, the number of the lesions that can be treated uh, effectively by uh, the percutaneous uh, ablation, despite that it's an efficient treatment uh, approach as well. And that's why the thyroid artery embolization emerged as uh, an idea for management of those patients. So uh, in general, managing different uh, tumors or uh, uh, embolizing different uh, tissues in the body uh, is not a strange idea in the interventional field. So uh, we are regularly embolizing uh, patients with nasopharyngeal angiofibroma as a preoperative measure to devascularize the lesion, and then the patient is treated surgically afterwards. And we are also treating uh, paragangliomas as uh, a preoperative measure or a palliative measure. We are also embolizing hemangioblastomas, hemangiopericytoma. Many, many hypervascular tumors in the body are treated by endovascular embolization. And also, we are uh, embolizing uh, some uh, malignant tumors like the patellar carcinoma, for example, uh, where we are uh, injecting chemotherapeutic agents uh, by endovascular approach. So the idea itself is not strange in the interventional field. They started by thinking about doing uh, an embolization of the thyroid artery as a preoperative measure, trying to uh, lower the operative risks by reducing the size of the gland before going to surgery, by reducing its vascularity, and also by minimizing the thyroid hyperfunction before going also to uh, surgery. Uh, and then uh, they discovered also that even without doing surgery, the embolization itself can reduce the size of the tumor, and therefore it can reduce the compression symptoms even without doing uh, surgery. Also, in some situations, as we mentioned, like, uh, for example, uh, in patients with cardiac arrhythmia and amiodarone-induced hyperthyroidism, uh, uh, doing endovascular embolization of thyroid artery may be the only solution in those patients. And it was shown to be very effective uh, in uh, this uh, complicated clinical uh, scenario. Uh, we have seen in the literature some publication like this one, for example, it was mentioned by Torshedi as well. So patients, 22 patients with Graves disease, 16 of them were treated only by embolization and six patients needed embolization followed by surgery uh, two to three weeks afterwards. No serious complications from the embolization occurred. And uh, uh, from uh, the, the patients, the 16 patients treated only by embolization, uh, all patients except two were thyroid. 
after uh, treatment, and just two patients were in need for uh, antithyroid uh, medication after the embolization. So it's very effective in lowering uh, uh, the, the, the hyperthyroid uh, status, even without uh, doing surgery. Another uh, publication, uh, uh, 56 patients with multinodular goiter, 22 of them uh, were patients having also hyperthyroid status, and uh, patients were treated only by endovascular embolization, and it was shown that after a few months, significant reduction of the size of the uh, gland and significant improvement in the compression symptoms occurred. The reduction was up to one-third to one-half of the initial gland volume, which was very uh, uh, enough to improve uh, the symptoms. And of the 22 patients treated by, uh, in the hyperthyroid status, treated by embolization, 19 of them were thyroid, which equals 86% uh, uh, success. So the goal of embolization is to decrease the volume of the gland, which may result in a significant improvement in the quality of life, and also to, to improve the hormonal status of patients with hyperthyroidism. The technique that we are doing is that we start first by doing the laboratory investigations, the needle laboratory investigation, the imaging, we do ultrasound, and we may do also CT or MRI. It's a multidisciplinary decision, as mentioned by Torsheri, it should be like that. So we'll choose the best approach for the patient, uh, and then uh, the patient will be asked if the decision to treat the patient by endovascular embolization, he will be asked to fast for six hours. It is done under local anesthesia, which is a big advantage, especially in some patients who are unfit for general anesthesia. Uh, we go by femoral puncture, and then we do an angiogram for all vessels. We know that the vascular supply of the thyroid gland is coming from two superior thyroid and two inferior thyroid branches and we have the thyroid EMA branch arising from the innominate. The superior thyroid is bifurcating into anterior and posterior branch, supplying most of the volume of uh, the gland in most cases. We may have also lateral branch, and we know that we have the inferior thyroid arteries uh, bifurcating into medial and lateral branches. We may have some collateral supply coming from the branches of the esophagus or trachea, and we may have collateral uh, pathways passing from one lobe to another uh, through uh, the isthmus of the gland. Uh, we, we tend to embolize two or three of the branches and we leave one of the thyroid arteries. We don't like to embolize all of them to avoid having uh, hypoparathyroidism after the embolization. We start by doing angiography first for all branches before going for embolization to, to be able to estimate which branch we will leave without embolization and which branch we will embolize. So in most cases we, we tend to occlude three of them. We choose the big, uh, the big three branches and we leave the smallest branch without embolization. Uh, we put our burn microcatheter, our vertebral uh, uh, or burn uh, five French microcatheter, uh, 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 sorry, diagnostic caster in the branches, and then through this diagnostic caster, we put the microcatheter. It may be a Renegade or Progret or any microcatheter with 2.3 to 2.8 uh, French uh, diameter. And then uh, we start to inject our part particles. The preferred embolizing material here is the particles. Uh, the ideal size of the particle uh, is uh, 150 to 250 microns if we are using PVA particles. If we use embosphere, which infiltrates uh, more than the PVA particles, we use 300 to 500 uh, microns. And then we inject until we have disappearance of the blush of the gland and occlusion of uh, the artery that we embolized. Uh, and after we have the regular care of uh, the puncture site, we know that some patients may uh, uh, complain from uh, some discomfort or pain in the neck after the embolization due to the ischemia that we induced by the embolization. So we give them uh, analgesic uh, steroids, anti-inflammatory, antibiotic, and this is enough to uh, control the symptoms that he, uh, sometimes the patient has after embolization. We know that some patients also may have rise of the uh, thyroid hormone levels after the embolization in the first week due to uh, the release of uh, the thyroid hormones due to ischemia and necrosis of the embolized thyroid tissue. So we have to monitor this. We do a regular thyroid function, function test every week for four to six weeks. And uh, if there is a need, we may give some anti-thyroid drugs. We monitor also the blood calcium level for the hypoparathyroidism. And we do regular clinical follow-up for a few weeks. Ultrasound every two weeks is ideal. CT and or MRI after three to six months to evaluate the decrease in size of uh, the gland uh, uh, to be done. So uh, this is the first case that we, we, we have done. We did it uh, just a few weeks ago, I think maybe three weeks ago. 
she is a 76-year-old female patient, cytotoxicosis, relapsed after medical treatment. She had multinodular goiter with large retrosternal extension causing compression symptoms, and she was a cardiac patient. She, was, she had ischemic heart disease, six coronary stents, and heart failure, and the cardiologist uh, told us that uh, she is not fit for uh, surgery. So this is the ultrasound that done for the patient. We can see uh, the volume of the gland, which is uh, very big, and we'll see also the CT scan. This is a CT scan of the patient. So we'll see uh, how large is uh, the gland and ex it, uh, it is extending uh, in a retrosternal location as we'll see now. And this is two lobes of the gland. Extending, causing compression symptoms for sure and uh, extending uh, retrosternally as we can see. So the patient was unfit for all other alternatives of management. Uh, we went by our microcatheter. First, we did a full angiogram for all branches, uh, two superior thyroid and two inferior thyroid. And then we found that the left superior thyroid is the smallest one. We decided to occlude the right superior thyroid and both inferior thyroid arteries. Uh, we did it as usual by uh, a microcatheter using embosphere 300 to 500 uh, microns. Uh, this is uh, the two, uh, uh, two superior thyroid branches and two inferior thyroid branches, as we can see. And this is after embolization. We occluded three of them, and this is the fourth one that we left to avoid having hypoparathyroidism. Uh, the, so far, the patient is clinically fine. We, we didn't have yet uh, the, the follow-up by imaging. We are still waiting for that because it's just a few weeks ago. But so far, for the time being, she had some discomfort in the neck, and it was controlled by medication and the procedure went without problem. Same for this patient, 48-year-old uh, man. He had multinodular toxic goiter, heavy smoker, diabetic type 2, had ischemic heart disease, and the cardiologist said that he cannot stop the antiplatelet, so he's not fit for surgery, and the decision was taken by the multidisciplinary team to go for uh, uh, endovascular embolization. This is the ultrasound done before, and this is uh, the report of the ultrasound. We can see also the size of the gland that is increased. Uh, the pathology uh, report that was uh, done. And then uh, this is a CT scan uh, that will show uh, the gland. It is increased in size, not as uh, the, the previous case, but it is increased in size as uh, we mentioned, and we had hyperthyroid status as well. We can see here the gland. So uh, we went uh, into the branches, uh, as we mentioned, all branches uh, were imaged uh, before going for embolization. Uh, superior thyroid on the right side, superior thyroid on the left side, uh, inferior thyroid on the right side, inferior thyroid on the left side, and uh, as we can see, the smaller one is the left, superior, uh, the left superior thyroid, so we decided to leave it without embolization. We embolized the right superior thyroid and both inferior thyroid branches, and we left the left superior thyroid without embolization. So um, we, can, we can conclude that coming from a background of neuro intervention, I can say that this is one of the most straightforward techniques that we are doing, honestly. Uh, there is nothing in medicine without complication, but it's very low complication rate procedure. It has been shown in some case series pub published up to now that uh, it's a very promising technique with very promising results. I think that uh, it's a good alternative that can be used sometimes whenever we decide that other, other treatment approaches will not be suitable. It's a multidisciplinary decision, as we mentioned. And uh, I think that by time in the future, the thyroid artery embolization will have more and more uh, uh, role accounted to, uh, to it as it showed uh, up to now good results with uh, low complication rates. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farouk, for a very nice presentation. And we now we will shift for the next speaker. Uh,